welcome everyone. Uh, for tonight's Concha y Café lesson, we will be talking a little bit about basically some of the ramifications of human history, um, colonialism, displacement, a lot of those, those kinds of big words and big ideas. Uh, and as Ms. Lowe's was just kind of sharing with her experience growing up in the East LA area and witnessing people being just outright racist and, and prejudiced against uh, non-native uh, English speakers and, and all of that. Um, you know, it's, uh, I think it's worth sharing at least that, you know, even in my uh, relative young age, you know, I also experienced that. Um, so I think that it's something that can obviously be seen and traced along through different eras in, in our history, and it's not something that has necessarily changed, unfortunately. But that doesn't mean that we can't analyze it and, you know, maybe turn it into something that could be to our creative benefit. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing our screen here. Um, for everybody following along on the live stream, uh, like I said earlier, you'll be able to actually access the handouts through our uh, Google class. And in order to be able to gain access to the Google class, you just go to our website, distillarts.org slash conchas y cafe zine. Um, but as usual, as is customary, I like to start off our sessions with a quote of the week. And this quote comes from one of my personal favorite writers, Eduardo Galeano. Uh, those of you who have been around in Conchas y Café for a while already probably know who he is. For those of you who are new to uh, Eduardo Galeano's work, he was born on the 3rd of September in the year 1940, and he passed on the 13th of April in 2015. He was from Uruguay. He was a journalist, writer, and novelist, considered, among other things, global soccer's preeminent man of letters and a, quote, literary giant of the Latin American left. Eduardo Galeano tuvo una influencia muy grande en uh, toda Latinoamérica. Y, pues, como ven aquí, él se cita diciendo, quien escribe, teje. Texto proviene del latín textum, que significa tejido. Con hilos de palabras vamos diciendo. Con hilos de tiempo vamos viviendo. Los textos son como nosotros, tejidos que andan. And in English, I translated it more or less as he who writes sows. Text comes from the Latin textum, which means textile. With strings of words, we go about speaking. With strings of time, we go about living. All text is like us, textiles that move. So, what does this quote say to you, my friends? ¿Cómo les parece esta cita? What is something that stands out about this for you? Feel free to Okay, I'll, I'll say something. Sure. Um, working downtown Los Angeles, and we used to go behind the textile uh, buildings, mm -hmm. and uh, we would get the uh, scraps and take them home and, and, and sew them, uh, make things out of them. And uh, to me, uh, and I do like to sew now when I can, sewing is a continuous, uh, like knitting, you know I mean, it's, it, it's, it's without ending, you know? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it continues it just it just goes i mean what can i say it just it just it's it just continues um it's like a family a tides hmm. you know uh generations you know just it just keeps going mm -hmm. so it makes sense but so know, would you say then miss lois just to kind of clarify for myself would you say that this this uh, quote is talking about the longevity of things? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A continuance. Yeah. Continuation of things. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I saw a hand from Abraham and then Julie. Yeah, I'm with you guys. Uh, basically, it's telling me, you know, a, a string comes from the past and then keeps on unwinding 
until we get into today when we're doing the next turn, right? Like mm. you're you're weaving, but it's also not just your past, but it's also the other fibers that you are connecting with. So it's changing the entire piece of um, fabric. If you think about the larger picture, is your 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 string is being connected with all those other fabrics it becomes this huge thing that we call i guess in this case language yeah yeah i, I could see that you know the it's like a union right that continues uh, of different lines or of strings right julie um when i first read about this i oh wait um I immediately thought about this book I read called Zeros and Ones. Mm. And it was based on the beginning of the computer. And it told the story of women and women as weavers huh. and how they use X's and O's mm -hmm. um, to create their textiles. Uh, and they basically, that was the beginning of the computer is these textiles uh, or tapestries. Um, which is also connected to uh, language, uh, you know, symbols, uh, math, you know, they're all sort of intertwined and it's all about communication. So I was just thinking about how, you know, words and textiles are so closely aligned through textiles. I mean, it's really amazing. I never would have thought about that now that you mentioned it. I remember when um, years ago I was going to, um, I think it was at Trade Tech over there in Washington, LA, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And uh, you talked about the computers and that was before the computers came out. And they were showing us how the uh, Orientals, the Asians, uh, do the little marble county. And then... Um, Somehow that that developed into I can't remember about that that, that was that was years ago I'm <laughs> I'm just telling my age Abacus. but uh, Abacus. yeah uh, we was doing the marble thing and then we did it and we did uh, the mathematic mm -hmm. uh, and then it went into the computers I don't remember how they did that but you brought that back to uh, a little uh, recall mm. yeah very interesting. Yeah, I believe Julie uh, said it's the abacus, and Zelda also concurred, I believe. Um, yeah, and, you know, Zelda in the chat also added, yes, like knitting, one takes threads, material in one form, and creates something new, creating new forms or transition. A texture is equal to tactile, 3D, visceral, and real, makes the abstract real, alive, and breathing. Um, Mojde in the chat also added, the strings of words can be as beautiful and colorful as textiles. Yeah. Oh, oh, very nice. Yeah. And then Alicia added also, those who write weave text and time through language and story or history. Therefore, it's passed down. Mm. Yeah, I think everyone is kind of hitting on, on a very similar idea here in that textiles themselves you know the physical object you know that could be a tool for storytelling and it can be a tool for also recording data um just actually yesterday as i was working on this handout i learned about the kipu I'm not sure if anyone here might be familiar with that but the kipu is a uh it's actually a device or a tool that was used by the people of the Incan Empire, the, the ancient um, Mesoamericans. And the kipu was basically a string, a long string that on it was tied a couple of uh, pieces of, of string as well. And then those strings used knots to indicate either 
um, a number, or it is also believed now that it also uh, was used to track lineages, you know, so families, it was something that was used for um, census, you know, and keeping count of all of the people that inhabited the Incan Empire. Uh, it was also a tool that was used as an accounting tool to see, you know, how, who owned what and where and how many. Um, so it was a it was a tool that was based entirely on threads. Uh, and it's still something that, you know, because of colonialism and its, you know, legacy in, in Latin America, you know, it's something that it, it sort of has been forgotten, at least the interpretation of it. The kipu no longer has the people who are able to interpret it for us, you know, as, as the Spaniards destroyed the, the texts, ultimately, of, of the uh, ancient Incan empire, the... Uh, the skill of interpretation has been lost and a form of language has now been lost. Uh, much like Julie was saying about, you know, it's, it's a, it was a binary system, a type of system that allowed for, for, yeah, you know, calculation, data collection, all sorts of different things, um, including people's names. So, uh, sort of coincidental in some ways, or maybe not, but you know, I find that this this particular quote is really interesting, you know, and, and it was something that uh, I was using even before I learned about the Kipu. So, um, you know, there's definitely something to this concept of all of us being a type of textile. You know, all of us are uh, bound to one another, whether it be through our personal lineage, our historical lineage. You know, there's there's just a lot of ways in which we can interpret this text to this this particular string of words that that we're trying to to absorb so river added in the chat that feels soothing to think of oneself as a type of textile and eric added also like sewing speaking and living we all change in movement through time yeah for sure and then you know if you get into like the other like you know uh, theoretical physics and we think about you know like uh the 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 weaving or the texture the textile that is the universe and our existence you know string theory exactly thank you julie um you know there's there's definitely a lot of different ways in which we can start to really get deep with this well i i was thinking and i don't know how closely related it could be but um when i know when my great Great grandmother, and I, I remember my great great grandmother. Uh, they used to do the quilts, mm -hmm. and uh, they would put in different um, uh, the names, and uh, this one was born there, and that one had this, that, or the other, and this one married that one, and and, and every every piece would represent something. Yeah, and uh, it would. I mean, it could grow as large as uh, <laughs> a floor. You know, and even more so as long as the linkage link it. Well, you know, the generations went on. Yeah, yeah but, uh, you know, they had to stop somewhere, but that that was a form of uh, just moving forward. Uh, just, um, I mean, one thing developing another. You know, it doesn't have an end. No, no ending. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's up to us to let it go continually, or we cut it off it's up to us that what you were saying about um that that placement what was that that statement about the placement you, you mean our thing our thing our thing at being out of place yeah something that's something you said but that wasn't exactly the words but uh yeah we we have the power whether we know it or not mm -hmm. to help it to continue to strive mm -hmm. or we can cut it mm -hmm. That's not that's that's sad though because like you say, um, and I don't know if this has anything to do with it because I'm just babbling right now. But you know, <laughs> domino effect, um, effect. Um, a lot of our young people don't uh, acknowledge the Lord as the older ones because each generation has a generation at a young age, mm -hmm. and their lack of knowledge and the lack of how do you say possibilities of giving the information 
to the one beneath them or comes after them and it gets less and less and less and less <laughs> so uh yeah we we have that um uh, oh man it's it's really sad that uh, we can't continue that which has been started and it's so important to keep it going mm -hmm. yeah i mean that's 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 sad that's sad and i can say that because my oldest daughter who is 61 had my granddaughter at at 16 or 17 mm -hmm. and my granddaughter and you know it went on down the line down the line and now i'm a great great grandma you know mm -hmm. but um, those mm -hmm. things happen and so the less um education on a certain subject or uh, issue or uh, situation you know uh, each generation mm -hmm. uh, is shortened i mean it's it's like cheated out of it yeah potentially i think you know there's there's something um definitely something to be said about you know the way that certain uh we'll call them habits or maybe certain traditions or certain uh customs you know they might change and evolve over time and to kind of go back to your uh observation of of like the quilt making as an example from the little bit that i know about the history of quilting you know, it was in some some areas a way to preserve the history of a family, you know, because every family is ultimately like a patchwork of different different communities, different people, different families coming together to be to form one bigger one. Right. Yes. And if we also kind of go with the metaphor of the string, you know, maybe some strings have to end in order for a new string to be attached. And if we think of it as, you know, maybe this is now a reinforcement or this is maybe the changing of the color, you know, in a, in a larger loom, yeah. you know, these are different ways in which we can at least track a certain kind of progress in oh, our okay. personal evolution as people, as, as human beings, you know. So we're going to kind of stick with this theme for today's session in talking uh about like strings and textiles and that kind of thing as a metaphor for us as as a human race um so you know to to sort of prep you for for the uh the the homework you know i have a couple of questions a little a few little exercises here that i like you all to take a moment to to answer um the first one is what are the strings that comprise your textile if you, as uh, Eduardo Galeano says, are a moving textile, you know, then what what are the strings that make up your textile? You know, define their texture, their color, how long they are, and the purpose that they serve within your tapestry. Okay, so take a quick second here, you know, write these things down. You can do it on a separate sheet of paper. You can also add them to the to the chat if you want to. Um, since you will be referencing these later, I do recommend that you write them down though on a piece of paper that you can have handy. So, or if you're on your computer, obviously you can also do it on a separate document. ¿Qué son los hilos que forman su tejido? Define sus texturas, colores, medidas, y propósito en el tejido que eres tú. Are some of the strings coarse? Are some of them smooth, like a fishing line? Or do they feel like yarn, kind of puffy, kind of loose? Is it all one color? Is it multiple colors? Are the colors complementary? I like rivers. Uh, response there. I'm a, I'm a Brillo pad and chicken feathers with maybe some random ragged silk. Very descriptive. So if you're done, or if you're still thinking about the textures and colors and lengths and the purpose of all those threads, you know, continue writing and begin adding now, how would you define a knot in your strings? ¿Cómo definiría un nudo en sus hilos? What type of knot is it? Where is it in your string? 
or strings? What purpose does it serve? What impact does it have on the tapestry of your being? ¿Qué tipo de nudo es? ¿Por dónde se encuentra o encuentran si hay más de uno? En sus hilos. ¿Qué uso tiene? ¿Cuál es su impacto en el tejido de su ser? Nice. I like that, Zelda. I'm as smooth as silk with tufts of cotton every two centimeters. I'm the Gordian knot, intractable, unknowable, unbroken, unraveled. Great reference. Is it a, a knot that might be used for maybe camping? Is it a nautical knot? Is it a figure eight knot? Is it a double knot? Is it the type of knot that you do by making the little rabbit ears and you cross the little rabbit ears? And more importantly, what does it serve? What is its purpose? What does it do for you? How does it affect the overall tapestry of who you are? Julie has added, I am soft purple and puffy with a hard wire inside. The length is my height a little longer. It helps me avoid injury, but there is always someone that finds my inner core, then sends an electric shock through my soul. I love it. You guys are already starting to get very poetic on me. <laughs> que venga la poesía. I like what Angie just added. Angie says, I'm silly string. <laughs> Are the knots in your tapestry similar to the knots of the kipu? Do they collect data? Are they meant to be read by only a few people? Again, what purpose do these knots serve? Y para seguirle, si la historia humana es como un hilo, ¿en cuáles puntos del tiempo existen los nudos? ¿Existiría un patrón de nudos? ¿Será que los nudos forman lazos, agujeros o arreglos? ¿Quién o qué hace los nudos? If human history is like a string, at what point or points in time do knots exist? Do these knots have a pattern? Do knots create loops, tears, or repairs? Who or what creates the knots? We have a little addition here from Zelda. I'm a velvet cord finished with a silver bell. Pull on it, ring, and I'll come running. Humans tie themselves in knots trying to be free. Mojde wrote, the white string of my mind tangled with my red and blue string of my heart and soul tied up with minds, hearts, and souls of many time to time. And Abraham added, strong ancient fibers try to bend the tip to a predestined direction, yet my fiber fights with every fiber to go where I want to go. My string is the color of orange and red, a fiber on fire turning into golden light, knots on my throat form, and yet I speak my mind for a string that knows where it wants to go can't be bent. Nice. Are the knots that exist in human history similar to the knots that are part of your tapestry? ¿Será que los nudos de la historia humana son idénticos o similares a los nudos que existen en el tejido que forma su ser? And I have one last question here for everyone to consider. What force brings all of these strings together? Describe this force, this mystical loom. Y la última pregunta que tengo para ustedes es, ¿Qué fuerza es la que une a tantos hilos? Describe esta fuerza, este telar místico. I like this last little addition from Zelda in the chat. I'm a knot the necessary but accidental bump in the road that slows you down. I don't think I can fit all four questions. Well, yeah, it's close enough, I think. 
So all four questions are on the screen now, or at least they should be. I'll give everyone maybe like another two minutes to try and answer as much as you can. Don't feel like you have to have all of it laid out yet. But do try to keep track of all the things you've written so far. We have from Zelda, the force is the tapestry of weft and warp ties us all together. Pull a string and all things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Sounds like a very delicate thing we are. River added, I'm the knot that you tie when you've finished sewing something, but it's not big enough so the thread slips through. But it's okay because you'll tie it to another thread and sew back over to try again. Y les digo otra vez que no se sientan presionados al terminar esta, estas uh, respuestas. En este momento es solo para formar ideas. Ooh, that's a good one. I had to navigate the knots that were put upon me. I like how that sounds. Navigate is such a good word for that. All right, so hopefully this gave you some, some ideas, some thoughts. And I'd like to revisit the quote one more time. Now that we've had this little discussion and, you know, looking at the quote again, you know, it reads again one more time from Eduardo Galeano. He who writes sows. Text comes from the Latin textum, which means textile. With strings of words, we go about speaking. With strings of time, we go about living. All text is like us. Textiles that move. Quien escribe teje. Texto proviene del latín textum, que significa tejido. Con hilos de palabras vamos diciendo. Con hilos de tiempo vamos viviendo. Los textos son como nosotros, tejidos que andan. So looking at this quote one more time. How is your mind assimilating this quote now? What are you thinking now that you've started to metaphorically embody your own textile? Do you now have a different point of view after the discussion or after all this writing? And this is open to anybody who would like to answer that question for us. Uh, you mean our, our, of our own writings? Yeah, of your own writing oh, or okay. response. Okay, I, I, this one I'm gonna make try and make it quick though, because I I I um, how do you say? Typed it in my phone. Uh -huh. Okay, I hope it makes sense. Okay, classwork, my textile string. Okay, uh, my textile string of inheritance, motivated by the colors of red, gold but unwoven background of bitterness displaced and on call for cruel treatment that developed strengths, a desire to be a light for those who had similar darkness of tracking a brightness of helping my brother or sister to weather the, their storm. Every acquaintance, old and new, considered as my prima or primo, Love helps my string to continue. One might go astray. Who wants to be free, but the string does not end. It just makes way for another string. String to become part of the woven path of those who are determined to go forth and forever forward. Recalling or remembering those things that some people consider as a knot, but as in all ropes, streams we learn to reach beyond and above the knot as not to be hindered keeping a made-up mind to focus the special made string that's not made by the hand of man the spiritual string that cannot be touched by human force mm. and that's the end excellent thank you miss lois 
You're welcome. I really like that image of, or or the line of the uh, the string does not end; it just makes way for another one to begin. You gave that to us. I I I, I put plagiarized. How do you say plagiarized? What what's that word? Plagiarized. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's out in the world, so it's it's a what is it called? A Creative Commons. Okay. <laughs> so you have my permission to to interpret. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I also really like what Angie just added in the chat as well. Looking at life from this point of view makes me feel like though we may run into the feeling of not fitting, those knots really show that we are meant to be here too. Yeah, I really like that. Because yeah, I mean, in the end, you know, the the theme of this particular series of Concha y Café is out of place, Right. And I believe that all of us at some point in our life experience something that makes us feel out of place. You know, that could be looked at in a lot of different ways. But in the end, you know, if we look at like the larger global picture, you know, we're not the only ones that feel that way. We're actually part of a bigger history where, you know, everything has a knot, right? And the tapestry of, of human life is, you know, full of different colors, different knots, tears, repairs, all sorts of different things that ultimately, just like Angie said, you know, it means that we are he actually meant to be here, wherever here is. So, you know, I, I think that we can at least find some sort of maybe peace in that. But it doesn't mean we have to also accept the tears, you know, and, and all the th different things that have happened, right? We can We can learn from them, I think so that we don't repeat them. At least I hope not. <laughs> any other uh, thoughts or any new like interpretations of the quote from this week? Hay algo nuevo que se les ocurrió al hacer este ejercicio? Oh, yeah. Here I go again. <laughs> uh, I'm, 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 by listening to all of you, I'm learning more about um, this description that textiles uh, can play into a mortal's life, mm -hmm. um, but uh, leaning more toward that displacement in life itself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just being, how do you say, uh, from that background of so much um, malice hate, evilness because of one's skin color. You know, most of you have seen me and I'm the darkest in my family and even my own family. I mean, you know, they, they took after the more of the Indian side than I did, you know, I don't care. <laughs> but uh, growing up, I had a very, very hard time, a very hard time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, 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 it was crazy. So that uh, I, I, my son and I, we were talking about it today and yesterday. And he says, mom, he says, you still have some of those um, knots. <laughs> uh, because, of, you know, when people say that you're not this, you're not that, you're never going to be this, that, or the other. Mm -hmm. And it keeps you kind of like, um, I had a, late, a Spanish girlfriend, her name was Veronica, they used to call her Mousy. You know, it makes you feel kind of mousy, makes you feel like, you know, you shrug yourself. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it, it took a while for me to um, blossom. Hmm. And uh, he says, I still have some tendencies of not uh, allowing my inner strengths to um, be exposed or to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, let them flow. Yeah, I think um, it's interesting that, uh, you know, you would see that even now in, in your life, you know, and um, and I think it's actually fairly normal. Um, it's unfortunate, but it is normal. I mean, those are all the things that that we all carry with us, you know, and um, and I appreciate you sharing that, Miss Lois. So, you know, I appreciate the vulnerability uh, in admitting that because, you know, for some people, it's very hard to admit things like that. Um, but the good thing is, you know, that we're at least able to recognize them when we can and, you know, we can do something about it. So 
Uh, so yeah, so thank you. Uh, we have a hand raised also from Zelda. There. So um, you were asking, is there anything else that comes to mind with this quote and the notion of text? I'm sorry, uh, textile. And I think what I what came to mind to me was the notion of covering oneself. Mm. We've been talking about tapestry, uh, which is often a sacred piece, which is hung on the wall because it's so delicate and cannot, you know, needs to be preserved. There's also the notion of textile, of clothing and covering oneself, protecting oneself from the elements. Mm -hmm. And my mind wandered from there to the notion of us being one big tapestry responsible for the planet and how we might protect the planet and questions of sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's where my mind is drifting when mm -hmm. you ask that question. Mm, very notable. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's, um, I mean, that that does tie into, I think, a lot of the ways in which we can interpret the purpose of, of text, you know, the purpose of, uh, you know, us trying to use some form of communication where, you know, communication can help us preserve and it can help us, you know, continue stories and it can help us uh, do so many different things. And textiles as a form of communication could potentially play a role in that in the same way that you know we might use uh like prayer as a form of spiritual protection you know the 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 word itself can be also maybe a form of i don't know physical protection if if it helps de-escalate or i don't know i mean there's so many different ways in which we can start to sort of connect these these this as a metaphor right for just existing so um so i appreciate the the uh you know different interpretations and and the ways in which everyone's minds seem to be working uh in making different connections so thank you zelda yeah. abraham well it's just the kind of the quick one that changed um while well, hearing everybody is like um can see these as um tapestry like or a big piece that involves a lot of people, like a culture, to to make a piece, right? Like a larger piece, mm -hmm. or to think you as all the materials, the types of strings and colors, and what you end up end up as a piece yourself. So it's either the culture itself as a larger piece, or one small piece that's who you gonna become. I'll become a rug, a sweater. I don't know. Yeah, you know, maybe that's maybe that is another way of interpreting it, right? The functionality of our tejido, you know, what what purpose is is our unique story going to serve, you know? Yeah. Um, because different different types of textiles serve different purposes, you know. Yeah. So. And Miss Zelda was saying what she said, and then when Miss my brother Abraham came on, uh, that reminds me of how. The elders of each family, you know, the how the uh, Indians, um, Native Americans, had their their uh, leader, and then the grandmas and the grandpas of uh, other cultures, um, you know, were the leaders of the family. They were they were that tapestry, mm -hmm. and some are still are, you know, in some of our foreign countries. Native lands over there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, there's there's so many different things that I, I mean, just speaking from like a metaphor point of view, you know, like I said, textiles can can serve so many different purposes, from the very real and tangible to the spiritual, and 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 so much more. Um, so because we are talking about you know text as a form of textile right it's uh or at least in the words of uh eduardo galeano you know with strings of words we go about speaking con hilos de palabras vamos diciendo con hilos de tiempo vamos viviendo you know there's there's ways in which we can begin to also be a little more deliberate in the way in which we present our words and being that this is, of course, a poetry class, 
uh, you know, we have a couple of key words here or vocabulary words, techniques, so to speak, uh, that I like to review on occasion. Um, a lot of you are already familiar with these things, but, you know, it always serves, I think, a, a bigger purpose to be reminded of how they look and how they function in poetry, especially because we're going to start talking about the craft of weaving words together. But the line break, right? That's probably the most basic way of understanding the, the way in which we uh, form a verse, we'll call it. You know, un verso, un renglón de poesía, uh, tiene su punto donde termina. You know, that, that last basic word, we'll call it, of, of a line of poetry. That is the line break. Um, here in the example, we have the word strings followed by the comma. And that is as simple as, as you see there, line break, right? Um, knots tie temporal strings enclosing errant fibers, forming perpetual karmatic time loops. So each line has its point where it stops. That is a line break. Now, enjambment is a more creative way of approaching a line break. An enjambment, and those of you who know me know this is one of my favorite tools to use in poetry. It's the running on of a thought from one line, couplet, or stanza to the next without a syntactical break. So this is really important, without the syntax breaking. So if we think of grammar, right, and we think of the way that we write sentences, you know, there's always that sort of subject, verb, predicate kind of structure. What an enjambment does is it purposely breaks a line so that the reader either feels compelled to move forward on, into the poem um, so that they get kind of like a resolution. Uh, but at the same time, the reader will also kind of be forced to stop and consider what is being read first. Uh, so it has this sort of two dual purpose kind of thing going on. En cabalgamiento, aquí definitivamente es uno de, de las técnicas que a mí me, me gusta usar más en mi poesía y es porque es algo que se hace con un propósito simple, reforzar ideas o imágenes en, en los renglones de poesía. To me, an enjambment is purely about reinforcing images or ideas within your, your poem. You can almost think of it as creating miniature poems within a larger poem. So in the example you'll see here, it's the same exact thing that's written up here, exactly the same. There is no difference. The thing that you will notice, though, is that the words now are purposely uh, split up, right? So the enjambment now reads, knots tie, temporal strings, enclosing, errant fibers forming, perpetual chromatic time loops. It might be a little more difficult to get from just this particular, uh, I guess, line of poetry. But you, when you start reading, you'll start kind of slowing down a little bit with an enjambment. Um, that is one of the effects that I particularly particularly like about uh, enjambment. So you you end up with these uh, kind of juxtapositions, really, that either reinforce an idea, reinforce an image, or create something that isn't really what you would have thought would have been there. To begin with, um, question in the chat is: Could I talk about using punctuation with enjambment? I never know when to use capitals to emphasize. I'm assuming, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, the way that I like to think of punctuation, especially things like commas, semicolons, or periods, you, they're they're ultimately there to help create a pause. So if you end a line with punctuation, it's always good to read that as a, an extended pause. It's telling you to slow down before moving on to the next line. But also when you look at the larger sentence of a piece of poetry, of a stanza, 
you know, it's there to also provide you with a little bit of grammatical structure, right? Um, the way that the, the comma is used here, it's sort of used as a way to reinforce the line before it. Knots tie temporal strings, enclosing errant fibers. You know, so that's supporting the first line. Then the, the second comma is letting us know that there's going to be now a resolution to the sentence. It's like a, a compound sentence that's happening, forming perpetual chromatic time loops. Um, so it kind of uh, quantifies, I guess, the rest of the sentence there. Now, in enjambment, you have the option, I guess you could say, of using the same punctuation, but now in a more strategic way so that you're telling people to pause inside of a line. And that pausing inside of a line could be used as a form of sejura, which is a different uh, poetry technique. It's something that you can create uh, kind of like as a rhythmic pause um, inside of a line of poetry. So what this does, especially with enjambment, is that it creates that sense of, okay, I need to pause and, and interpret or digest what I just read before continuing. Um, meanwhile, the end, because there's no, no uh, punctuation there, they theoretically could force a person to move on to the next line. Um, and that's really the purpose of an enjambment, is to force the reader to move on to the next line uh, without breaking the syntax of the, of the sentence. I don't know if that makes sense. A lot of this is theoretical. So it comes down to style, you know, and if it's more, you know, your style to add these little pops of emphasis using capital letters, using, you know, uh, pauses, then, you know, that's something that you will eventually develop as you develop your voice. But um, capitalization is something that uh, I personally think works if it denotes the beginning of a sentence. Um, I don't normally like to uh, capitalize the first letter of a line of poetry because it sort of loses the impact of a capitalization. Uh, capitalization works really well to help either add emphasis or to just let a person know that this is the idea of X, Y, and Z, you know, as opposed to just I don't know. Um, like, it's kind of like the difference between capital G God and lowercase g God, right? Capital G God usually is understood to, to mean the Christian God, whereas a capital G God is something that is uh, outside, ultimately, of, of that, of that Christian, uh, uh, what is it called? Hegemony. So, um, doesn't mean that it's incorrect or wrong, you know, it just means that it's just a different way of uh, interpreting, you know, or emphasizing the the placement of that God within society. Uh, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> All right. Um, yes, I think so. I think it's very much what, like you said, it's as you develop your voice, you can test these things to see. So for example, if I say knots tie, and then I have the capital T temporal strings, it would be knots tie temporal strings as opposed to knots tie temporal strings, I think. Yeah. But it, it definitely creates another rhythm mm -hmm. to it. And, and I, you know, initially I've been playing with enjambment also because I really love that form, but I always felt tempted to add the capital letter on the next line without really thinking through how that would affect the pattern and the rhythm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's a, a great way to look at it too, because poetry is not just sonic. It's not just an, an uh, aural uh, form. It's also a, you know, visual form when people read it on the page, they don't always have the benefit of you there to perform it for them. So they won't really know where you're emphasizing if you're capitalizing every single line um, at the beginning. So you can be strategic about using the visual 
elements of language to then help a reader know where your rhythm is meant to go and where your emphasis is meant to go. Uh, you know, so so it, it does kind of come down to voice and performance to a certain certain degree. Um, and then also just what feels right for you, you know, because what works for me as a poet may not work for you as a poet. You know, your, your voice is going to be equally as unique as anyone else's. And that's that's OK. And then, of course, juxtaposition, that's the last one that uh, you could kind of call a, a use of line break. Right. It's it's a very specific way of constructing your lines so that you have a little bit of tension kind of created between words that maybe go together or maybe don't go together. Uh, juxtaposition is, I think, a bigger concept than what I'm able to, to show here. But <clears throat> excuse me, but, you know, it is something that you can uh, also just kind of consider as, as being one of the main tools when it comes to uh, creating line breaks that are very deliberate. So, um, and in this case, you can see here, right, again, I moved around some of the words, uh, this time to take advantage of some of the alliteration, so tie temporal, and then fibers forming. So, you know, again, it's just different approach to essentially the same problem. How am I going to create a rhythm that adds an emphasis where I want it? So, yeah. And then again, you know, with the punctuation, it's in my particular style, it's just a way of indicating pauses um, while also using it in a most of the time correct grammatical way too. So, yeah. All right. So we're going to put this into practice just a little bit. So referencing some of the answers that you used earlier for the questions, um, I'd like you to write a four line stanza that uses either some of the lines, the complete lines or select words from your answers to the previous questions and try to use one of the three things, either juxtaposition, enjambment or just a you know basic line break. So this is you, you, you want a total of four lines with the two examples. Uh, one. One, one example. Yeah, one example of, of the three things that I that I covered. So every time I think about the enjambment, it makes me think about Michelle Smith. <laughs> yeah, she she knows. I've talked to her about that a lot. So yeah. Um, pero sí, la práctica en el momento es escribe una estrofa de cuatro líneas que usa palabras selectas de sus respuestas a las previas preguntas, incorporando en la estrofa una de las tres técnicas de salto de línea. So you can revisit anything that you already wrote. Um, if you wrote it in the chat, you could probably find it if you scroll back up in the chat. Um, but yeah, try to try to apply either an enjambment, try to apply a juxtaposition, try to apply your understanding of a line break. This is homework, right? This is a little exercise for right now. Oh. <laughs> this isn't the complete homework, not yet. Oh, oh okay. I'm gonna have to leave a little bit early today. Only made about 30 minutes. All righty. For the pre-broadcasting. Right. Okay, dokie. Well, yeah, I'm gonna give y'all like another two minutes. Oh, man. Put this into practice, and then we'll go into the poem for tonight. Here, I'll show the, the three things again. So line break. Not to be hindered. Enjambment. And juxtaposition. I like it. I like it. Mojde added in the chat. Fear to be and love. Do and undo the string of my life, the white string of my mind, tangled with my red and blue, string of my heart and soul, tied up with minds, hearts, and souls of many time to time. And I'm trying to read them with the line breaks, so that way you can hopefully get a sense of how it might sound. River added also, chicken feathers barb, me. I tack them proudly to my cork. 
I roll in silk dust, then slither home. Oof, that's good. <laughs> Those are some good enjambments right there. Do say focus. <laughs> Sorry. I'll give everyone one more minute here. And again, don't feel like you have to be done at this moment. In the chat, Zelda added, I'm as smooth as silk, woven and trussed with tufts of cotton. Nice, nice. Eric added in the chat, reinforced threads of finely woven Spider-Man silk, iridescent and bioluminescent of indefinite length, its colors for camouflage. Love that. Good use of internal rhyme with iridescent and bioluminescent. For me, 10,000 strings reach out. Beyond and above the knot. Yeah. So for the sake of time, we'll move on to the poem. I love that everyone is, is continuing to share in the chat. Zelda added, I'm the Gordian knot, intractable and unknowable, unbroken. And Julie continued, each with a knot of love, hate, lust. I am eternally, I am eternally entangled in the knots. I like it. Sorry for the typos. <laughs> oh, that's okay. All yeah, right. Well, the knots. Yeah. So for tonight's poem to kind of... Um, just reinforce the use of enjambment in particular. Uh, I've selected uh, Pablo Neruda. For those of you that know, aside from Eduardo Galeano, Pablo Neruda is also one of my favorite writers. Uh, this particular poem is called Tierras Ofendidas, and it comes from his book Residencia en la Tierra, Offended Lands, and it comes from Residence on Earth. The Spanish is obviously the original, and then I have a translation here that was bun, done by Donald D. Walsh. So that is who we are reading for tonight. Um, to give my voice a rest, who would like to read either the English or the Spanish for us, uh, for us tonight? I'd be happy to read the Spanish. Sure. Okay. If you're ready, you can go for it now, River. Okay. Tierras ofendidas, Pablo Neruda, de residencia de en la tierra. Regiones sumerg sumergidas en el interminable martirio por el inacabable silencio, pulsos de abeja y roca exterminada. Tierras que en vez de trigo y trevo traes señal de sangre seca y crimen. Caudalosa, Galicia, pura como la lluvia, salada para siempre por las lágrimas. Extremadura en cuya orilla gusta de cielo, oh, my cursor, de cielo y aluminio, negro como agujero de bala, traicionada y herido y destrozado, badajo sin memoria entre sus hijos muertos, ya se mirando un cielo que recuerda. Málaga, arrada por la muerte y perseguida entre los precip precipicios, hasta que las enloquecidas mares azotaban la tierra con sus recién nacidos. Furor, velo, vuelo de luto y muerte y cólera, hasta que la, ya las lágrimas y el duelo reunidos hasta que las palabras y el desmayo y la ira no son sino un montón de huesos en un camino y una piedra enterrada por el polvo. Es tanto, tanta, tumba, tanto martirio, tanto galope de bestias en la estrella. Nada ni la victoria borrará el, el agujero terrible de la sangre. Nada ni el mar, ni el paso de arena y tiempo, ni el geranio ardiendo sobre la sepultura. 
Excellent job, River. Thank you. Very good. All right. And do we have a volunteer to read it for us in English? I'll give it a shot. Oh, oh. we got Miss. Oh, Luz. Hi, Luz. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Want to read English? Yes. So Miss Luz will read it for us in English whenever you are ready, Miss Luz. Thank you. Offended lands, Pablo Neruda. Region submerged in an interminable martyrdom through the unending silence pulses of bee and exterminated rock. You lands that instead of wheat and clover bring signs of dried blood and crime. Abundant ga Galicia, pure as rain, made salty forever by tears. Extremadura, on whose august shore of sky and aluminum, black as a bullet, whole, betrayed and wounded and shattered. Badajoz, without memory, among her dead sons, she lies watching a sky that remembers. Mal Malaga, plowed by death and pursued among the cliffs until the maddened mother, mothers beat upon the rock with their newborn sons. Fuhrer, light of morning and death and anger until the tears and grief now gathered until the words and the fainting and the anger are only a pile of bones in a road and a stone buried by dust. It is so much, so many tombs, so much martyrdom, so much galloping of beasts in the star. Nothing, not even victory, will erase the terrible hollow of the blood. Nothing, neither the sea nor the passage of sand and time, nor the geranium flaming upon the grave. Excellent. Thank you, Miss Luce. You're welcome. <laughs> Zelda says it actually sounds better in Espanol. I mean, to be fair, it was written originally in Spanish. But I do think that there are some very striking images in the English that we also see in the Spanish. So that's the beauty of, of a good translator, right? We are able to get more or less the same message uh, as we might get in the original language. But speaking of images, you know, because this is more about, you know, seeing the reinforcement that enjambment does how or what really stood out to you in this poem and why? What images, I should say, what images really stood out to you in this poem? Can you scroll down? Sure. Thank you. I think what was striking to me was this personification of these different um, parts. I'm assuming it's Spain because I recognize Malaga yeah. and there was Galicia. Um, I don't really know Badajoz and Furor, I'm, I don't think is a place, but anyway, the personification of these women mourning their sons, um, was quite striking to me. Malaga plowed by death, Badajoz among her dead sons, uh, somebody was beating, you know, uh, I think it's further off, uh, a beat upon the rock with their newborn sons, you know, it's very violent. The idea of a mother beating her children to death, uh, that is what is striking to me. Yeah. Julie? Um, yeah, I totally agree with Zelda on that violence there, but mm -hmm. I was going to mention um, the neither the sea nor the passage of sand and time. You know, I just... When he when he when he says sand and time, you know, you immediately see a, you know, a, a sand a, a time a timer that you flip over and what do you call those things? 
Yeah, an hourglass. Yeah. <laughs> an hourglass, yeah. And you know, and he's not saying an hourglass, mm -hmm. but he uses these words to describe, sort of describe an hourglass. And mm -hmm. I love that he did that. Like he was able to like describe something and then immediately I get the vision without saying the word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you there, you know, and, and I think that it was a very clever in that particular stanza. It's very clever because he's invoking the sea, right? And what is next to the sea? Well, a sandy beach, usually, right? So not only are we getting the dual imagery of the beach, but we're also getting the imagery of an hourglass, which is yeah. commonly filled with sand. You know, so so there is a very clever thing that's happening there um, by creating this very subtle juxtaposition within the enjambment. So yeah, I'm glad you picked up on that, Julie. Uh, we also have a hand up from River. I think the most striking enjambment for me, mm -hmm. probably because I love you know, like the way words go in rhythm, mm -hmm. is when he says, es tanto, tanta tumba, tanto materio, tanto, galope de bestias en la estrella. I, I love how he, he just stops us at tanta after es tanto and then moves us to tumba and then does it again. I'm not sure what I love about that, but but when I got to that line, I was like, oh, oh, I really like the way this is shaped and formed. Yeah, that's, you know, one of the benefits, obviously, of it being in, in its original language, right? We have the, the T repetition. So, you know, that, that alliteration helps there for sure. Um, it's not the same in the English, but you know, we still, at least in the English, get the benefit of the enjambment, which I think this in, this image by itself is a very, very strong image. The galloping of beasts in the star. Uh, galope de bestias en la estrella. It's, it is a pretty strong image to me. Um, yeah, Zelda added, it's the beating of the drum, a salsa or cumbia rhythm. Yeah. Anyone else? Any other... Uh, specific things that stood out. I know Mojde also uh, felt very strongly about the last stanza. Uh, Zelda? Yes, uh, I was wondering, do we know the context of this poem? Is it about the Spanish Civil War or? Yeah. Um... Yes, short okay. answer is yes. Uh -huh. um, yeah, this poem came out sometime between 1935 and 1945, mm -hmm. uh, or at least that's when it was written. Um, the book, Re Residencia en la Tierra, Residence on Earth, uh, if I remember correctly, was actually published in 1957 originally. Uh, so this, this was published uh, in this form at least several years after the, um, after the Spanish Civil War. But yes, this is basically a commentary on the atrocities of that time period. Well, to me, and I don't understand it all, but certain words and mm -hmm. um, phrases, um, it reminds me of the song of um, Marvin Gaye, where he says that there's too many uh, uh, people dying and too yeah. many mothers crying. Yeah. Yeah, and so this whole um, text here, it makes me sadden, mm -hmm. you know, and then the one, the part that where I guess all of her sons have passed away, it reminds me of uh, in the book of Ruth, <laughs> mm -hmm. where the lady lost her two sons, mm -hmm. and then her the youngest one, I, she, I guess she had another one, and she takes him. I guess where to the rocks where she, I guess, um, washes her clothes back in those days. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm just imagining. And then um, the reminiscing of her other lost older sons comes to mind. And mm -hmm. she just beats, you know, uh, against the rock, you know. So, I mean, it's it's sad. I, I have no idea what this... Uh, um, Peace is trying to um, untangle, you know. Yeah. But uh, it's it's sad. 
Yeah, that's an interesting connection to make because I, I wouldn't be surprised if Neruda did maybe draw from his understanding of the of the Bible to to maybe pull up that that image. Um, Zelda, I saw that you had your hand raised. Did you have something to add as well? Or? Oh no, that's okay. That's okay. Um, I, the thought passed. Ah. Yeah. Um, okay. Question. Yes. I'm gonna have to go. <laughs> okay. uh, can I pick my homework up uh, on the on the um, monitor? I mean, you know. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, we are coming to an end for tonight too. So I'll go ahead and and share the homework with you. Uh, this week, your homework is to write a poem that uses the metaphor of knots and textiles to reflect on the patterns of human history colonialism and displacement i'll add that also to our chat here just in case and also on our live stream for those who are following along on youtube facebook and i think twitter is also up right now y su tarea en español es escribe un poema que utiliza el metáfora de nudos y tejidos para reflexionar sobre los patrones de la historia humana, colonialismo y desplazamiento. <laughs> I apologize for how heavy that is. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, all of you did a fantastic job uh, making metaphor out of the concept of textiles and uh, strings and knots and all of the things that we were talking about at the beginning. So, I feel like you you should be able to do this um, for this week. Uh, also, you know, because part of the reason why I did bring up this this poem in particular, aside from um, you know Pablo Neruda being one of my favorite poets, and aside from it being a very strong example of how enjambment can function, this poem is also again about the Spanish Civil War, you know, and it's. Uh, like legacy on the lands where it happened. And there's a lot of things that are, you know, in contemporary society and modern day history, you know, that are uh, in a lot of ways mimicking what is happened, what has happened, I should say, in the past, right? And there's a, a very big uh, repetition of, of human history happening, you know, a hundred years ago around this same time period, we had the First World War, and we had Dadaist poets and artists who were reacting very strongly to the first time that, you know, civilians were being harmed, and the first time that chemical warfare was enacted, and, you know, a lot of different things that have become very recognized as just modern day war, right, modern day combat. The Spanish Civil War is no different. You know, the current wars that we see in the Middle East right now and in Ukraine, you know, it's not really that different. So, you know, going back to the concept of time and it being a string and our text also functioning as a string, you know, or, or a collection of strings that form a textile, you know, we as poets have the ability to string words together in a way that have an impact, that speak to what it is to be human. And so ultimately what I'm hoping you walk away with after tonight is kind of like the hope that we can make a difference with our words. You know, we may not be able to always be out there in the front line. We may not always find that that is the place for us, but for those of us that have a platform and who have the opportunity, you know, we can we can speak to the things that we understand as 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 essential to being human. So um, that's why I'm encouraging you to this week use the metaphor of textiles, knots, and all of that, you know, to really talk about human nature and to talk about the fabric of humanity. Because I feel like more and more that is what all of the big conversations go back to is the fabric of who we are. So, did anyone have any questions? 
It makes me feel like we aren't tying enough knots in the fabric of time. Well, maybe, or maybe we need to undo some, right? Um, knitting the notes. I like that much there. Um, and yeah, I, I suppose you could also look at it as a juxtaposition of nature and war, as Alicia is is pointing out in the chat. You know? um, a lot of these things do go hand in hand. So uh, I was going to offer to read the poem again one more time before we, we close out the session. Uh, but it is, we have gone over by a couple of minutes. Y'all want me to to read it for us one more time, or are we feeling good? <laughs> All right. If you read it in Spanish, okay. <laughs> All right. I say read it in Spanish, too. I vote for that. All right. Well, I'll, 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 I finish it in Spanish, but I'll also, for the sake of equity, I'll read it in English as well. Offended Lands by Pablo Neruda. Regions submerged in interminable martyrdom through the unending silence, pulses of bee and exterminated rock. You lands that instead of wheat and clover bring signs of dried blood and crime. Abundant Galicia, pure as rain, made salty forever by tears. Extremadura, on whose august shore of sky and aluminum, black as a bullet, whole, betrayed and wounded and shattered. Badajoz, without memory, among her dead sons, she lies watching a sky that remembers. Malaga, plowed by death and pursued among the cliffs until the maddened mothers beat upon the rock with their newborn sons. Fuhrer, flight of mourning and death and anger, until the tears and grief now gathered, until the words and the fainting and the anger are only a pile of bones in a road and a stone buried by the dust. It is so much, so many tombs, so much martyrdom, so much galloping of beasts in the star, nothing not even victory, will erase the terrible hollow of the blood. Nothing, neither the sea nor the passage of sand and time, nor the geranium flaming upon the grave. Y en español les presento Tierras Ofendidas, de Pablo Neruda. Regiones sumergidas en el interminable martirio por el inacabable silencio, pulsos de abeja y roca exterminada, tierras que en vez de trigo y trebol, traes señal de sangre seca y crimen, caudalosa Galicia, pura como la lluvia, salada para siempre por las lágrimas, Extremadura, en cuya orilla augusta de cielo y al aluminio, negro como agujero de bala, traicionado y herido y destrozado, Badajoz sin memoria, entre sus hijos muertos yace mirando un cielo que recuerda, Málaga, arada por la muerte y perseguida entre los precipicios hasta que las enloquecidas madres azotaban la piedra, con sus recién nacidos, furor, vuelo de luto y muerte y cólera, hasta que ya las lágrimas y el duelo reunidos, hasta que las palabras y el desmayo y la ira no son sino un montón de huesos en un camino y una piedra enterrada por el polvo. Es tanto, tanta, tumba, tanto martirio, tanto, Galope de bestias en la estrella, nada, ni la victoria borrará el agujero terrible de la sangre, nada, ni el mar, ni el paso de arena y tiempo, ni el geranio ardiendo sobre la sepultura. So thank you, everyone. Aquí tienen de nuevo su tarea. I hope that you, you know, feel inspired by today's uh, just, you know, general discussion about 
time and our metaphors um, that we all have within us. So uh, again, next week, we uh, actually know. I was going to say next week we'll have a workshop, but I am actually wrong. Next week, being that it is Thanksgiving week, uh, we are going to be taking the week off. So that means that you actually have two weeks this time to write your poems. And the Tuesday after Thanksgiving will be when we will uh, give you the opportunity to share with your cohorts um, in class. So, yeah, turkey party, as Abraham says. Uh, so, you know, enjoy your your uh, turkey day next week for those of you that, that do celebrate it. Uh, I do hope that, you know, you have a restful time and we'll see you all back again here uh, two weeks from today. And for those who are watching the live stream, you know, thank you for joining in. Uh, again, if you want access to the handouts and to all of the other uh, previous lessons, you just go to our website, distillarts.org slash conchas y cafezine, fully enroll to our Google class, and you will have access to all the materials that we have covered up to this point. And the deadline to submit final writing to potentially be uh, published in the next issue of Conchas y Cafezine is December 19th. That's Tuesday, December 19th. I'll start reminding all of you, and you are more than welcome to submit now uh, as, as you finish off those pieces of writing. So thank you, everyone. And with that, we will call it a night. I hope you all have a great, great week. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, everyone. Un placer, como siempre. Bye. Have a happy Thanksgiving. You too. <laughs>